Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. It's time for Lombardi Memories, a show that takes you back in time into January or February to the greatest one-day spectacle in all of sports. This is the Every Other Tuesday podcast that looks back at each and every one of the 50-plus Super Bowls and tells the story of who won and why. For the fan who needs more than just a box score, this podcast goes drive-by-drive, play-by-play through the most dramatic games in history. I'm your host, Tommy A. Phillips, and you can visit my website at TommyAPhillips.com where you can find all of my books. Those include Great 80s. You can go to Great80s.com, spell out G-R-E-A-T-E-I-G-H-T-I-E-S.com. And you can find this book called Great 80s, which talks about this Super Bowl we'll be talking about today. And the next nine, too, all throughout the 80s, all the Super Bowls. And my book will give you the full story of not just this game, but also the entire 1980s season. And today we have Super Bowl 15. It was held on January 25th, 1981, the first Super Bowl officially of the 80s decade, the 1980s season. It was between the third-time AFC champion Oakland Raiders. Actually, one was the AFL, but they were back in the Super Bowl for the third time. And then you had the first-time NFC champions, the Philadelphia Eagles. As always, we have a pop quiz and then homework at the end of the episode. The pop quiz question for today is, What individual record that was set in this game still stands today? This one is a little easier than most of the pop quiz questions, but the answer will come at the end of the podcast, near it at least. So the Philadelphia Eagles, they got off to a roaring start in 1980. They won 11 of their first 12 games, beating the Dallas Cowboys in their first game against them along the way. But then they stumbled down the stretch to three losses in their final four games, including a season-ending loss to Dallas, which made the Eagles and Cowboys finish with the same record at 12-4. and Philadelphia had the tiebreaker, so the Eagles won the division and the Cowboys were one of the wild cards. The Eagles breezed by the Minnesota Vikings 31-16 in the divisional round. For the NFC Championship game, they'd have to play a three-match, the third game against the Cowboys on the season. Using the legs of running back Wilbert Montgomery, the Eagles ran all over Dallas and beat them 20-7 at Veterans Stadium in Philadelphia to clinch a spot in the 15th Super Bowl, which is their first. Montgomery ran for 778 yards and eight touchdowns, which weren't entirely impressive numbers, but still very solid. 
quarterback Ron Jaworski threw for over 3,500 yards and 27 touchdowns with just 12 interceptions all season. His most thrown to receiver was Montgomery, who had 50 catches. The deep threats came from Harold Carmichael and Charlie Smith, who both went over 800 yards and 45 catches. The Oakland Raiders, meanwhile, did things the hard way. They lost five regular season games, including a 10-7 loss to the Eagles in Week 12. The Raiders finished at 11-5, which tied them for the best record in the conference. But it wasn't enough even to win the division, though, because the 11-5 Chargers held the tiebreaker over them. The Raiders' only way to the Super Bowl was through the wildcard game. The Raiders won easily at home in, against Houston in the wild card game before one of the most famous games in NFL history. It was Red Right 88, the fateful call by the Browns, where NFL MVP of 1980 quarterback Brian Sype threw an interception in the final minutes of the game when Cleveland all they needed was a field goal. The Raiders ended up winning 14-12. And then the Raiders won a shootout in San Diego. They got off to a big lead and held on to win. And that gave them their third Super Bowl appearance. Quarterback Dan Pastorini started the season as starter, but he got hurt and Jim Plunkett had to come in. Plunkett was serviceable throwing for just shy of 2,300 yards and 18 touchdowns, but also 16 interceptions. The leading Oakland receivers were Bob Chandler with 49 grabs for 786 yards and 10 touchdowns, and Cliff Brantz with 44 catches for 858 yards and 7 touchdowns. Running backs Mark Van Egan and Kenny King combined for just short of 1,600 rushing yards and nine touchdowns. Of course, the biggest storyline that had to do with the Raiders this season had to do with their owner, Al Davis, being in a fight with the National Football League as he wanted to move the Raiders to Los Angeles. That decision would go to court, but for now, everyone looked forward to seeing what would happen if the Oakland Raiders won the Super Bowl. How would NFL Commissioner Pete Rozelle congratulate Al Davis should the Raiders get the Lombardi Trophy? That was in the back of everyone's mind as this game began. Chris Barr, the brother of Steelers kicker Matt Barr, who played in the previous Super Bowl, well, Chris Barr was the kick kickoff specialist to start Super Bowl XV. The Eagles got the ball after the kickoff, but on only the third play of the game, Ron Jaworski tried going play action, and he got picked off by linebacker Rod Martin. Martin returned this pick to the Philadelphia 30-yard line. The Raiders were going to go three and out, but an offside penalty on the Eagles kept the drive alive. Van Egan ran for a first down, then on that new third down that they got, and then Plunkett found Cliff France down at the five-yard line for a first and goal. After Van Egan got it down to about the one, Plunkett scrambled and threw him the run to Brantz, hitting him in the end zone for the game's first touchdown, 7-0 Oakland. The teams traded three and outs after that. So then on the Eagles' third drive, Jaworski hit tight end Keith Krepley, I cannot pronounce that name. Keith Crefley. Oh, what a name. Uh, well, he found him for eight yards, and he handed off to Montgomery then for a first down. Jaworski then fired a screen to Montgomery, and he got 13 more yards. The Eagles now, they, they got close to the midfield, and they faced the third and long, but Jaworski threw a bomb downfield and found Rodney Parker, his receiver, and it was a touchdown, except that it wasn't. 
because Harold Carmichael, he was in motion on the play. And while he was in motion, he actually ended up moving forward as the ball was snapped. And since he was doing that, which it's illegal, the touchdown got wiped off the board. It was illegal motion. And the Eagles didn't get a first down on their next play, so they ended up punting. So running back Kenny King ran for a six-yard game for the Raiders to get the ball to the 20 before a record-setting play. Plunkett was given all day to throw. And he used the time that he was given to scramble out and throw to King on the run. King had a convoy, and he sprinted to the end zone for an 80-yard touchdown. It was the longest pass in Super Bowl history, and it would remain so throughout the first 30 Super Bowls. As the first quarter came to an end, the Raiders led it 14 to nothing. The Eagles finally got something going on the first drive of the second quarter. Montgomery started out with an eight-yard run, and Jaworski went play action and fired to tight end John Spagnola for 22 yards. Jaworski threw a bomb for receiver Charlie Smith in the end zone on the next play, but Oakland defensive back Lester Hayes knocked it away at the last second. So that was the second time a Jaws pass could have been a touchdown, but wasn't. Jaworski did get the Eagles into field goal range, firing a 24-yard pass to Montgomery. But the Eagles settled for a 30-yard Tony Franklin field goal, and they trailed 14-3. On the ensuing kickoff, Raiders defensive back Keith Moody fumbled after getting hit by the Eagles' Ron Baker. The ball came loose, but Rod Martin recovered the fumble for Oakland. It was a crucial recovery that prevented Philadelphia from getting back in the game. Now, the Raiders didn't score in this possession, but they managed to flip field position on an exchange of punts. On Oakland's next possession, Van Egan started out by running twice and getting a first down, and then Plunkett found Brantz for a first down at the 36. King ran for four more, and Plunkett scrambled to the 27, but he came up a yard shy in third down. So Barr came in, tried a 45-yard field goal. Kick was a bit to the right, a little short, no good. Now Jaworski came back, and he threw the Carmichael for a 30-yard gain, and the Eagles were into Raiders' territory at the two-minute warning. Jaworski then went to Carmichael again for a first down at the 27. Then Montgomery caught a pass and spun for a first down at the 12. However, the Eagles got nothing out of this end-of-half drive because Franklin had his 28-yard field goal blocked by Oakland linebacker Ted Hendricks. The Raiders went to the half holding a 14-3 lead over Philadelphia. To start out the second half, the Raiders got the ball, and they got charged for holding holding on their first play, but they made up for it, marched right downfield, plunked it through the King for 13 yards. They went long to Bob Chandler for a 32-yard pickup. Van Egan ran for four more. Then Plunkett went play action to Brantz. It was a play action pass to Brantz, and Plunkett heaves it high into the end zone, and Eagles defensive back Roy Nell Young has a chance at intercepting it, but Cliff Brantz gets his hands in there, catches it for a touchdown, 29 yards, instead of being an interception, and the Raiders are up 21-3. to Despite the fact that Eagles head coach Dick Vermeil ran a tight ship, his team was making mistakes left and right. First, linebacker John Bunting touched the kickoff before it bounced out of bounds, backing up the Eagles deep in their own territory. Then Jaworski threw another interception to Rod Martin. This pick would set up Oakland's next score. Plunkett found 
tight end Ray Chester for 16 yards. And then he hit Chandler for another first down at the 32. That all set up a 46-yard field goal by Chris Barr, one of the longest in Super Bowl history at this point. Not the longest, though, but a very long one. And that gave the Raiders a 24-3 lead entering the fourth quarter. So the Eagles needed something. It was desperation time here. Jaworski nearly got sacked for a safety on Philadelphia's next drive, but he got the ball away for a long pass, and Charlie Smith hauled it in for a big gain down to the Oakland 45. Montgomery ran for a first down before the Eagles faced a fourth down. They had to go for it, of course. They're down 21 points, and Jaworski found Rodney Parker to move the chains down to the 12-yard line. Facing fourth down again, the Eagles got lucky when the Raiders jumped offside. And now Jaworski found Keith Crefley in the back of the end zone for a touchdown. I got his name right this time. And the Eagles pulled within 24 to 10. So Oakland needed to do something to put the game away, and that's exactly what they did on their next drive. Van Egan ran for eight yards, then he picked up a first down on his next carry. Plunkett fired to Chester for a nice gain, and a roughing the passer penalty moved the ball further for Oakland. Plunkett nearly threw an interception to defensive back Herman Edwards, but Cliff Brandt broke it up to force an incompletion. After that near mistake, Plunkett followed it up by firing to Chandler for a 23-yard game. The Raiders ended up getting a 35-yard field goal from Chris Barr, and they led 27-10 with eight and a half minutes to play. The Eagles' final two chances in this game would end in turnovers. First, Jaworski fumbled a snap in Oakland territory, which Raiders defensive end Willie Jones recovered. Then Jaworski threw a third interception to Rod Martin. That made Martin the first and only player to this date to intercept three passes in a single Super Bowl. The Raiders had won their second Super Bowl 27-10, to and now it was time for Al Davis to receive the Lombardi Trophy. Surprisingly, Pete Rozelle and Al Davis had a peaceful transfer of the trophy, and Davis called it, famously, our finest hour. Plunkett completed 13 of 21 passes for 261 yards and three touchdowns, suffering just one sack. He had a passer rating of 145.0, and he was named Super Bowl MVP. There's a little arguing with those stats, but if I were to give the award to someone else, I'd give it to Rod Martin for his three interceptions. Never before or since has a player picked off three passes, making him the answer to to today's pop quiz question. He was an unusual hero for this game, a role player who ended up having his biggest moment in the biggest game of all. Now, as for the most valuable player on the losing team, that would have to be Wilbert Montgomery of the Eagles. He rushed for 44 yards and caught six passes for 91 yards. He and Carmichael were the only two offensive players to really contribute to the Philadelphia cause. The Eagles had a rough day with Jaworski throwing 38 passes but completing fewer than half of them. Jaws' passer rating was a putrid 49.3. I think he gets too much blame for this performance. Instead, I give the least valuable player award to the entire offensive line of the Eagles. NBC during this game made a point to show that Plunkett was getting four plus seconds to throw and Jaws had less than two seconds to throw. So Jaworski, he couldn't really do anything playing behind turnstiles. 
it, it was just very difficult for him. So, yeah, sorry, the offensive line was the problem in this game for the Eagles. The best player you've never heard of? Well, that's difficult because the Raiders are such a well-known team. If I were to pick a player who isn't as well-known, i go with defensive back Burgess Owens, who played great in the secondary and picked up seven tackles throughout this game. Owens was part of a secondary, including Lester Hayes, that wouldn't allow Joss to throw it deep. Now, the biggest play of the game, of course, was the 80-yard touchdown to Kenny King by Jim Plunkett. It wasn't designed as a long pass. Instead, Plunkett was just trying to get something out of a somewhat broken play, and King ended up making the catch in space having all the room in the world to sprint down the field for a touchdown. That made it 14-0, to and as we know, the Eagles never even reached 14 points. So what's the biggest play that no one remembers? There's a couple of those, actually. You, you may think I'll pick Carmichael's illegal motion penalty that wiped out a long touchdown pass to Parker, but I think you probably do remember that play. So I'm going to go with a couple others. One of them was Jaworski throwing a bomb to Charlie Smith in the end zone. But Lester Hayes broke it up at the last second. That saved the touchdown. Eagles got only a field goal out of it. Then on the ensuing kickoff, Rod Martin luckily recovered a fumble by Moody to keep the ball with Oakland. While I believe that instant replay would have given the ball back to Oakland had it existed at the time, well, it, it, there was no instant replay reviews at the time. So if the Eagles would have recovered it, it would have been their ball. And if they recover it, it's an entirely different game. Now, I've got some homework for you, and I've got an excellent book for you this time to read. It is called Cheating is Encouraged, A Hard-Nosed History of the 1970s Raiders. Yes, I know it says 70s, but there's a bunch in there on the 1980 team going through Super Bowl 15. In fact, that's the ultimate chapter of the book that brings the rest of the book together. Obviously, the 70s were a great decade for the Raiders, but the 80s were when they had their most Super Bowl success. We will find out more about them in a short while. As for now, we move on to a different dynasty. It's the San Francisco 49ers who will go for their first Super Bowl against another team in their first big game, the Cincinnati Bengals. Which of these worst-to-first teams will come out on top? Which will become a dynasty and which one will remain snake-bitten? It all comes in two weeks when we get to Super Bowl 16. Again, you can find all my books at TommyAPhillips.com where I have a book on the great 80s. It's called Great 80s. It's all about the 80s in the NFL. You'll get everything you've heard today and more from it until next time so long we here at the sports history network proudly partner with 26 podcasts all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com 
slash sports history books. Pick up your copy today. Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.